Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. So this is something I never anticipated purchasing as I was perfectly happy with my standard 16 to 35 millimeter wide angle focal length, but when I switched from Sony full frame to a Fuji crop sensor last year, I picked up the 10 to 24 millimeter, which is what I'm filming with right now, which is also very close to the full frame equivalent of a 16 to 35 that I was already very comfortable with. And although my 10 to 24, it's absolutely fantastic for video, I didn't find it strong for stills, especially when it comes to uh, corner sharpness. So I did a bit of research and found out that one of the most revered wide lenses from Fuji is this, the eight to 16 millimeter, which is the full frame equivalent of a 12 to 24, making it an ultra wide angle lens. Now I'll spare you all the, the boring details, but after testing this lens out for a month or so, I ended up purchasing it as I was very impressed with the corner to corner sharpness and the fact that this has very little distortion considering it is such a wide focal length. But after using this lens now for the past maybe five or six months, I've noticed a few significant and notable challenges. And in this video, I wanna share with you the, I guess the, the real struggles that, that I've encountered with using an ultra wide angle lens for landscape photography. Now, I don't really wanna call these thing, these issues because well, I guess issues are, are able to be resolved as well, but these are really, I consider these just struggles or, or obstacles to overcome. And there was really five of them. And the very first one is something that I called weather dependent or condition dependent. And it's just the fact that an ultra wide angle lens is a very condition dependent lens, as opposed to that of a, a telephoto lens. A telephoto lens has got a very narrow field of view. So you can easily cut out the sky. Most of my, uh, my longer or my telephoto shots don't even have the sky in it. So a telephoto lens is not as weather dependent as an ultra wide angle lens. So nine times out of 10, if you're on location and you're using an ultra wide angle lens, you're gonna have a large portion of your image is gonna be the sky. And if the sky is not cooperating, it could potentially ruin your overall photograph. Here's an image right here that I think is a, a great representation of that. This composition is not the strongest composition, but I do think it, it works. The wave action definitely helps it out. And I figured if I could get a nice, colorful, explosive sunrise or sunset here, this would be a fantastic image. But on this particular day, kind of a blustery afternoon and some fog was rolling in and there's just no texture in the sky at all. No matter what I could, no matter what post-processing wizardry I tried to apply, I could not get any texture to appear here. And it's just a very flat and otherwise dull image. And the sky I think really is the reason for that. So I decided to come back to this location the very next morning, I got there super early for sunrise and all the conditions were, were really looking like it was gonna work out. I remember being super excited about it. And here's the image I came away with. I altered the composition slightly. I shifted over to the right just a little bit and the sky definitely works in this scenario. I was able to see this little bit of island back here, which is the, the background interest in this particular image. So that's definitely required to kind of pull this photograph off. But the sky definitely has interest. It is some color in here. So I like this photograph much, much better. And I just think that's a good example of how a boring sky can ruin an ultra wide angle photograph. Now in this example right here, once again, not the most exciting composition in the world, but I figured with a very high dynamic and explosive sunrise or sunset, that would help pull this image together. And although that this sky in this situation is, it's not too bad, there is some interest, there is some decent color, there's just something about this photograph that it's just missing it. I think with a, a very mediocre composition like this one, you really need a, a superb sky to make this work. And it, I just didn't get it in this particular situation. So just being aware of, um, of the sky and what the sky is doing and how weather dependent and ultra wide angle lenses is something that's good to, to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And the only way I found to resolve this is just to head to the woods. I shoot a lot of waterfalls in North Carolina, and this is shot with the eight to 16 millimeter lens, wide open at eight millimeters, cutting out all the sky. So heading to the woods is perhaps the best way to resolve this weather dependency to, to remove the overall sky, but that's not always a possibility sometimes, but it's just something good to keep in the back of your mind. Now, the second challenge is something that I call scene stretching. Now, you might be familiar with telephoto lenses where it actually kind of flattens the depth of field. It kind of compresses everything together where an ultra wide angle lens is the exact opposite of that, where it actually exaggerates the depth of field. And in this example right here, this is shot with a, a 50 or shot at 55 millimeters. This cliff face right here, it's not absolutely massive, but the scale of the people on the on top of it 
helps provide or helps kind of tell the story that it is a, a substantial size cliff right here. Now this very next image is shot with this lens right here, wide open at eight millimeters from pretty much a very similar vantage point. And now look at the cliff face in the background. It's so tiny. This is at 55 millimeters and this is at eight. And you can really see that. I mean, you can, you can barely even make out that there is a cliff in the background now. And that's an issue with an ultra wide angle lens is that exaggeration of the depth of field and how it makes anything in the background appear much smaller than it did while you're on location. And this image right here is actually the cropped version. This is the full version right here. This isn't the fully edited photo that I went with, but I ended up cropping this image because it was just too much over here on this side and it was just not as interesting at all. But I am happy with this overall photograph, but that kind of scene stretching effect is something that you want to have in the back of your mind whenever you're composing your images. Now this third challenge, and this is a big one, and it's something that I call the add-ons. Now I knew that an ultra wide angle lens, and this is the case for, for most of them, I can't say it for all of them, but most ultra wide angle lenses have a bulb front element, which means you basically can't apply any type of a filter to it. You usually have to get a very special specialized filter just for that specific lens. And I knew that, but I did not accurately quantify the financial ramifications of such a buying decision where I didn't go out and look to see how much it was gonna cost. Now, I've been using Nissi filters for years. I'm a big fan of Nissi filters, and I know there are some cheaper alternatives out there, but I really like the quality of their glass. So I ended up purchasing this. And I'm sure you've seen this in videos of mine before. I get a lot of questions about this, mainly because I think it, it looks kind of ridiculous. It looks like a, a Frisbee on the end of your lens element, but it works great. But this cost almost $500 which in my mind is absolutely ridiculous for one single filter. It, like I said, it, it works great, great results, but it's extremely, extremely expensive, expensive. And it comes with the whole filter kit, so you can slot in additional filters as well. And thankfully, I don't really use a lot of solid ND filters or graduated neutral density filters, but if you are one of those people that purchases polarizer, solid NDs, graduated neutral density filters, you could easily surpass the price of your lens in just filters. So just being aware before you make your ultra wide angle purchase to, to maybe do a little bit of research and figure out what filters you need for that particular lens and how much that's gonna cost as well because that might change your buying decision a little bit. Now the fourth struggle or yeah, first fourth struggle or obstacle to overcome is, overcome is something that I call crowded comps. And this is also an issue with wide angle lenses but when you're using an ultra wide angle lens that issue is just exacerbated further because your field of view is so much wider. And the issue is basically, how, how, how do you organize everything in your scene? Because you're capturing so much real estate. Where do you put everything in your image to come away with a pleasing looking photograph? And this image right here, this uh, the water level was lower than it normally is this particular year, which isn't the most ideal scenario. But I remember being on location, I really did, I do, and I still do like this photograph. I like this kind of line of rocks right through here. I like the sky, I like the reflection, but when I was composing this shot, I remember what was all going through my mind because I could see so much through this lens and I could see so many different areas of interest that I wanted to kind of put in my composition and it ended up with just a very crowded composition. Now the, the low water level did not help it in this particular image, but I was looking at the bubbles in the background. Of course, that was the main subject. This fall color here, this light hitting over here, and of course, all the rocks and these reeds in the water. And it just resulted in a kind of a, an overall crowded composition. So it's something that you definitely want to be aware of. It's a very common issue with wide angle and ultra wide angle lenses. And here's another example right through here where I like the image, but there's a lot going on with the triangles pointing to the center area here, this waterfall coming down, this area through here. From a compositional perspective, I do think it works. It checks off a lot of those boxes of things you look for in a good composition, but it's not the most relaxing photograph to look at, in my opinion. It definitely does look a, a little bit crowded. For uh, for my liking, I usually try to come away with a little bit more simplistic photographs, and it's one of the pr big issues, not issue, one of the big obstacles to overcome when using an ultra wide angle lens is just trying to come away with non, trying to come away with a composition that's not crowded or it looks like you have a ton of stuff or stuff, a ton of stuff stuffed into the scene. That was a horrible horrible way to explain that. But I think you understand what I'm saying. Just crowded compositions is something to uh, to avoid. Now, 
This next one is, uh, oh, this issue, right? Not an issue. This is something I do want to show you real quick. There's a lot of fantastic benefits of also having this really ultra wide focal length. And this image right here, I think is a, a great representation of that where this lighthouse is not the easiest thing to photograph. You really need to, to photogra photograph this not at high tide in the scenario here. I only had one opportunity to go here and it was at high tide as you can see. And there's only a couple rocks that you can kind of get out on the, in the ocean on and kind of angle your camera back to capture the, the sunset and the rocks leading up to the lighthouse. And since it was high tide, so many of those rocks were underwater. So I had even less rocks to kind of, to kind of scavenger on, but I was still able to, to get out as far as I could safely and still be able to open this all the way up to eight millimeters and angle it backwards and still capture the rocks in the foreground, the lighthouse in the upper right hand corner and the setting sun. So that was a, uh, that this, this is the image that really comes to my mind as to when having that super wide focal length was absolutely critical because anything other than an ultra wide angle lens, I wouldn't have been able to capture this image. Now, the fifth obstacle to overcome is something called the smear effect. And most lenses are always sharper in the center and as you move out towards the corners, that sharpness kind of falls off a little bit and starts to get a little bit softer. Now you couple that with the fact that many ultra wide and wide angle lenses have a little bit of distortion in the corners as well. You add that distortion in with this softening effect and it kind of creates this smeared look, almost like your image was painted, almost like it was a painting and someone just took their fingers and, and rubbed it across the wet paint in the corner because it just kind of smears it. Now, it's not too bad with this lens. It's one of the, the things I love about this lens. It has very little distortion, but the 10 to 24 I'm filming on, this image right here, this is the main reason why I wanted to abandon the 10 to 24 for stills and opt for something a little bit better. And it's because of this. So if you look in the center area right through here, everything looks sharp, tack sharp, no issues at all. But if you come up here to the corners, look at that. You get this kind of stretching effect and the fact that it just looks like it's kind of out of focus there. And if you look over here as well, you can really see it over here. It just looks like it's stretched and it's softening and it just has that kind of smeared effect in the corners. So that smear effect is something that you want to be aware of. There's not a whole lot you can do for it. I mean, you can correct for distortion easily in, uh, in post-processing. But that smear effect is going to be kind of uh, difficult to uh, the resolve that 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 kind of lack of detail in the corner. So just something to once again to uh, to be aware of. So those are really the the five obstacles that I encountered in my first half a year from using an ultra wide angle lens. I absolutely do love using this lens. You just have to think about some things a little bit differently. But I can say that out of all the focal lengths I've ever used. This ultra wide focal length is by far the most difficult overall than uh, than anything else. And it makes sense because it's just it's very wide and you're going to have a lot of things in your scene, which means you have a lot of things to think about, which means you have a lot of things to compose in certain ways and to determine how you're going to create that overall pleasing looking image. So before I do wrap up this week's video, I do want to say a big thanks again to just the square to the, the square space to the, the I've done that before in a video. Actually, I want to say a big thanks to the sponsor of this week's video, which is Squarespace, who I use for for all of my website and e commerce and my, my blog needs. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery just so you can make it your own. With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends in page visits and views to better optimize your content. And you can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools, which will enable you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products or blog posts and logo, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you're looking to start a new website or possibly upgrade your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So if you're looking to get an ultra wide angle lens, I hope some of the information in this video is helpful. I hope, hopefully it will help in your, uh, your future buying decisions. And as always, if you have any questions about anything covered in this video, uh, definitely leave those in the comments section below and I guarantee I will get back in touch with you. And if you did enjoy this week's video, if you could give it that thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And also ring the little bell notification as well, just that way you are notified the next time I do upload. And as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video and I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.